Persona 5 is a game with roots in the theme of making the change you want to see in the world. It posits the idea of active change being a necessary part of life, something which is impossible without people having the will to make change happen. It tracks, then, that even the narrative of the game itself requires a significant shift at the midpoint which entirely changes the direction of the story, changing both the main character's goals and the stakes they are up against. The reason for this change, however, couldn't just be anything. It had to be something which significantly contrasts what we already knew about the world up until that point. The reason for that change had to be a little special. The reason for that change had to be Futaba Sakura. Today I'm going to look into how Futaba Sakura creates a bridge between the two halves of Persona 5's story by contrasting what we learn in the beginning against the developments which occur later on. To do this, we'll be delving into her arc of the story and seeing just what about it is special enough that it can impact the entire plot as heavily as it does. Naturally, this means that this video is going to contain major spoilers for Persona 5, particularly up until the end of August in game. I won't be mentioning anything regarding the new third semester added in Persona 5 Royal, but I'd still recommend you play through the original game or watch a Let's Play before watching this video. The anime is also an option, the dubbing is incredible, the actual animation not so much, and the manga is currently ongoing up until and including Futaba's arc. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the analysis! Before we can really understand how the scope of Persona 5 changes, we need to go over what we know from the game's first three palaces, up until July in-game. In April, we are introduced to the idea of another world, the metaverse, where people's thoughts are manifested physically. Within the metaverse, there are palaces, locations created through the cognition of a specific person. Palaces are built upon people's distorted desires, mostly villains who wish harm upon other people for their own self-satisfaction. They manifest through the palace ruler's views on the world and the people around them which are twisted from how things are in reality, thus being distorted. The core of a palace, their treasure, represents the thing which incited the distorted views of the world, such as a medal for an Olympic athlete, or a masterpiece for a plagiarising artist, or just straight up money for a mafia boss. The thing about palaces is that they are natural exaggerations, twisted visions of the way palace rulers view the world around them. As a rule, for something to be a distortion, it has to be different from in reality. Thus, Madarame's palace was not based upon a real-world museum, nor was Kaneshiro's based on a real bank. If people accepted Kamoshida as their king in the real world, then his view of Shujin Academy wouldn't be entirely untrue either. But the distortion appears in that the palace rulers are each living within their own fantastical version of their real-world experiences, without considering the reality of them. Kamoshida sees his abuse of the Shujin students as a form of love. Madarame sees his plagiarism as a correct use of the tools at his disposal and Kanashiro sees his blackmail as a display of his power and influence. None of them can open their eyes to the truth of just how many people they are hurting through their actions, because they would rather live within the fantasy they have created than in the unforgiving real world. And yet, because they see the world the way they do, the palace rulers present themselves differently in reality from how their shadows do within their palaces. In the real world, each palace ruler wears a mask to present themselves in a way that will allow their internal reality to flourish. Because Kamashida acts as a well-respected and competent teacher, he is trusted by the principal and allowed further power within Shujin that he can abuse as he likes. Madarame acts as a humble old man, not only to deceive those who view his art in galleries, but also to deceive his own students students, thus allowing him to freely take their art for himself. As for Kaneshiro, though he keeps his name hidden, he is respected and feared by his cronies in the Mafia, thus allowing him to continue blackmailing innocent students and collecting more and more money. The lies that each palace ruler presents to the world allow them to continue living their version of the truth within their heads, and their shadows represent the reality of each ruler. A lecherous abuser, a cowardly fraud, and a fly on dirty money, as it were. Thus, from the first three palaces, we know that palaces themselves represent a false version of reality, and that shadows represent the true form of the palace ruler. The fourth palace we encounter, however, does not belong to a heinous villain. Instead, it belongs to a shut-in teenager whose grief and depression leaves her isolated within her room, only able to connect to the outside world under pseudonyms and internet aliases. Two years before the main story, Futaba's mother dies in a car accident, one which is believed to be a suicide caused by maternity neurosis. After being read her mother's suicide note and being passed between neglectful and abusive relatives, Futaba comes to believe that she is responsible for her mother's death and thus begins to develop 
up a distorted view of the world. When she reaches out to the Phantom Thieves, she does so under her hacker alias, Alibaba, asking them to change her own heart. Whilst it's not explained so explicitly in the game, it's implied that Futaba's initial reason for reaching out is because she believes she is a bad person, someone who is corrupt enough to need her heart changed so she can repent, much like the thieves' previous targets have done. She is overcome by grief and guilt, and this is reflected in the state of her pyramid palace. Futaba's palace is incredibly detailed, giving us some deep insights into her state of mind. Its setting within a desert is explained within the game. Futaba doesn't care about the outside world, with the only sign of civilization being a small town representing Yongmin Jaya, which is still abandoned and lifeless. The fact that it is represented at all is likely due to Sojiro, the owner of Café Le Blanc, whose house Futaba has lived in since Sojiro took custody of her. With Futaba having bugged Café Le Blanc so she can listen in on it, the café remains the one place outside of her own home that she seems to pay much attention to it all. Naturally, part of this interest may also be due to the fact that the protagonist, Joker, lives within LeBlanc's attic during the course of the game, thus allowing Futaba to find out about the Phantom Thieves, who she then reaches out to for help. The pyramid itself, however, is our main focus. Pyramids are sacred within ancient Egyptian culture, symbolising death and rebirth, a clear connection to Futaba's regret over her mother's death and her desire for her mother to be alive again. The fact that this is a sacred place also signifies just how important her mother was to her before her death. And yet, the pyramid itself is crumbling on the inside as the thieves make their way through it, showing how Futaba's heart is breaking down more as they progress. The sped up deterioration of the palace is likely due to her pushing the thieves away instinctively as an anxiety response. Even though she asks the thieves to change her heart, their doing so is making Futaba all the more aware of the guilt she feels, thus causing her to experience more frequent hallucinations in the real world. Essentially, her whole view of the world is falling apart. The chamber of guilt crumbles as you walk through it, showing how her guilt is tearing her up, and the chamber of sanctuary has a giant pit in the middle of it, symbolising how she is missing the thing that gave her the most comfort and safety, her mother. Interestingly, her whole palace is integrated with technology, reflecting how she lives her life through the screen of a computer rather than facing the outside world. The racing binary code on the pillars brings to mind Sojiro's words about how she's always coming to conclusions in her head, and the characters decorating the doors and treasure chests are all symbols used in computing, including everything from mathematical symbols and Greek and Latin symbols to the emojis featured on the giant boulders, which are also featured as stickers in Futaba's bedroom in the real world. The area of the palace most heavily featuring technology is the Chamber of Emptiness, the final area before her treasure, which also represents her bedroom and the space she views as safe. The fact that it's called empty not only relates to how this area is the one which is the most deteriorated, but also to how this is the part of Futaba's heart which has lost the most in her distortion. Essentially, Futaba's palace is falling apart the same way that her life is, because she is suffering so much grief and guilt, pushing her life away in the belief that she deserves to die in a tomb of her own making. However, there is one particular feature of Futaba's palace which stands out for its oddity, Futaba's shadow. Throughout the palace, the thieves encounter Futaba's shadow several times. She asks them to reclaim a lost map from a thief in town, then gives it to them to aid through their infiltration. She then attempts to lead, or navigate, them through the palace, only to take them straight into traps caused by Futaba's instinct to push people away. By the end of the palace, the phantom thieves are left wondering whether Futaba's shadow is trying to help them or to hinder them. But here's the rub. Futaba's shadow is not the ruler of this palace in anything but name. The game even hints at this in its UI. Futaba's security level portrait never changes from the shaded silhouette of the real Futaba, even after you meet Futaba's shadow, where in other palaces it changes after that point. Considering there is an unused asset for a shadow Futaba security level portrait, this is clearly an intentional choice on the game designer's part. Futaba's shadow is not the one in control of the traps, nor is she the one telling Futaba that she is guilty for her mother's death. The voices telling Futaba she's guilty come from her own hallucinations, memories of uncaring relatives yelling at her, of men in black suits reading her mother's supposed last words aloud to her, of her mother's wrath towards her. But these are all untrue. Just like the other palace rulers, Futaba's palace is built upon the lies that she believes about the world around her, the lies that started after her mother's death. Futaba's shadow represents the truth, cold, harsh and logical, but trying earnestly to make Futaba open her eyes to reality. Because here's the thing. It's not just her guilt that makes Futaba reach out to the Phantom Thieves. Some subconscious, repressed part of her wants to see the truth, to remember that she's not the one responsible for her mother's death. 
that she's living in a world of ruthless fabrication. We know this because Futaba's shadow represents the truth of herself that she represses in reality, the desire she subconsciously holds to find the truth and keep on living. When the palace crumbles, it's not only because of her heartbreak, but also a symbol of how the lies around her are slowly being dismantled as she opens her heart to the Phantom Thieves, and thus to the truth. The most critical piece of evidence in this case is Futaba's hallucinations. Over the course of her palace, we see her suffer auditory and visual hallucinations several times, most often featuring her relatives' voices as well as a vision of her mother looming over her. These are representative of the lies she believes in, the ones that rule over her cognitive world. Only once does her shadow ever appear in these hallucinations, on the morning that the Phantom Thieves plan to give Futaba her calling card. I am the other you. Is this some kind of hallucination? It's different from usual. How long will you continue blaming yourself and shutting yourself away from the world? Blaming myself for what? For your mother's death. Don't you think it's time you grasp the truth of that moment? What happened before your eyes? What happened to your mother? The truth. Why did you choose to rely on the Phantom Thieves? That's... Are you simply going to shut yourself in and do nothing? Are you going to avert your eyes from the true answer? <sighs> if so, I will kill them in your world. In this conversation, Futaba's shadow interrogates her real-world self, not to blame her for her mother's death, but instead to blame her for looking away from reality. Her shadow is actively pushing Futaba to open her eyes to the truth, to stop indulging in her sin of sloth, and instead to stand up and make change for herself. Thus, when Futaba finds that the new app on her phone is the same one the thieves use to enter the metaverse, she uses it to enter her own palace, knowing that she can use it to change her own heart. Though she has asked the thieves for help, her shadow encourages Futaba to make that change herself. So if Futaba's shadow isn't the true ruler of the palace, then it comes into question who the real palace ruler is. The answer comes in the form of the biggest lie in Futaba's heart, the cognition of her mother, Wakaba. The cognitive Wakaba Ishiki is a sphinx, which in ancient Egyptian culture were said to guard pyramids to ensure everything inside was kept safe from potential thieves. It's said they prevented the uninitiated from accessing the wisdom kept within them, which in this case likely relates to how the cognitive Wakaba is the guardian built from Futaba's lies, and simultaneously the biggest obstacle between Futaba and the truth. She represents the core lie that Futaba believes, that she deserves to die because of her mother's death. In contrast, Shadow Futaba represents represents Futaba's repressed desire to keep living and to remember the truth, which is why Futaba can only stand up against the cognition of her mother once she accepts the truth that her shadow presents her with. You're the reason she committed suicide. You were just getting in the way of her research. Why did you think it was suicide? Because of the note. Exactly. The men in black suits read her suicide note to you. And what was written on it? All of her complaints... about me. Yes. The shock and the pain led you to avert your eyes. But they kept reading it aloud in front of your relatives. Think hard. Was that suicide note real? Would the mother you loved so much truly have written that? Did she ever say such horrible things to you? No! She scolded me whenever I had tantrums, but she cared for me! Then what about the suicide note? A total lie! You were used. They forged her suicide note and laid the blame of her death upon you. They trampled all over your young heart! Get mad! Don't forgive those rotten adults! It's because I couldn't face myself. Poor Mom's death. Even then... Why did they have to yell at me like that? 
In a logical pattern of hypothesis, evidence, analysis and conclusions, Futaba's shadow encourages her to open her eyes to the truth, thus allowing her a clear view of the reality she has been avoiding all this time. She finally gains the power to fight back, turning her shadow's truth into her strength, her persona. Futaba's strength is found in seeking the truth and dismantling lies, not only by bringing down the corrupt people who deceive others, but by giving their victims the strength to fight back as well. This is mirrored in Futaba's abilities as a navigator, where she gives her teammates the strength they need to face any enemy, as well as lighting the true path ahead of them. Her persona, Necronomicon, represents forbidden wisdom which she reveals, once again tying back to her role as the one who shows others the truth. When Futaba helps to take down her own palace, we understand that her pyramid was not only a place dedicated to the wish to revive her mother, it's also the place where Futaba herself is revived. She is the treasure, the one who locked herself within her own tomb due to the lies she believed, but once she reclaims the truth, she reclaims her life, thus being the end of her own distortion. Throughout the rest of the game, Futaba continues to represent the dismantlement of lies and the path toward the truth. Before this point, the thieves are only looking to take down corrupt adults as they happen to come across them. It's only once Futaba joins the party that they can begin to uncover the truth about the mental shutdowns and psychotic breakdowns, not only due to her hacking skills but also because of the knowledge of her mother's cognitive science research. As their obstacles begin to come from the real world as well as the metaverse, it is because of Futaba's help and expertise that the Phantom Thieves are able to to find potential problems and avoid them, thus allowing them to eventually reach their goal of uncovering the truth and ending the corruption that others are causing within the metaverse. It's important to note, of course, that her own development would not have been possible if she hadn't reached out to the Phantom Thieves. With their help, she begins to want to see the truth, rather than living forever in the dark. But as much as they helped her reach out, she's the one who chose to grab on and pull herself back into the light. So Futaba Sakura is a little special. She's a navigator where all her friends are fighters, she's an ex shutin who's still growing accustomed to the world around her, she's a little odd and eccentric, but she represents the truth, lighting the way for the Phantom Thieves so they can begin to uncover the bigger conspiracy lurking beneath the palace as they topple. Where every other palace ruler is forced to confront the truth, Futaba chooses to seek her truth, dismantling the lies she's lived by so that she can fight back against the world's fabrications. Futaba shows us that palaces and distortions are more than just comically evil villains looking out for their own self-satisfaction. She allows us to see that anyone can view the world in a distorted fashion and that without facing the truth, nothing can change. But that's just my opinion. Futaba's arc and her palace are my favourite things about Persona 5, so I've been wanting to delve deeper into them for a long time. I still feel like I've only skimmed the surface of Futaba's character, so I'll be making an extra Can We Talk About video to gush some more about her sometime soon, so stay tuned for that. In the meantime, if you have any thoughts on Futaba's palace and her impact on the game, feel free to leave a little comment down below if you like. I love reading theories and opinions, and given how effective Futaba's story is, I'm sure there's a lot that I missed in this video. It'd be great to hear what y'all think. I also have some other analysis videos here, though they're all for games from the Tales of series. Feel free to check those out if they sound interesting. I personally recommend the one I did for Yuri Lowell from Tales of Vesperia. I had a ton of fun delving into his character in that one. Also, sorry for the long wait since the last analysis video. I'm hoping to try getting back into making these a little more often. I have a few ideas for Persona 5 ones as well as some other Tales analyses, so keep your eyes peeled for those. If you have any suggestions of topics you'd like me to make videos on in the future, feel free to leave those down below if you like. I can't promise I'll make them anytime soon, but I do keep a list of suggestions that I refer to when making analysis content, and it'd be great to hear what you all would like to see from me in the future. Also, uh, the art you're seeing on screen right now is by me. I have a Twitter where I post art sometimes if you feel like checking that out. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you all enjoyed this video. Stay safe and have a lovely day, night, or whatever the time it's for you. I'll see you next time.